The Red Room Riddle by Scott Corbett, Chapter 5. If Jamie Bly had looked as frightened as I felt at that moment, I don't know what I might have done. But he merely put a finger to thin lips puckered into a sly smile. He murmured two words. The caretaker. The caretaker? At first it seemed preposterous to suggest anyone was taking care of such a house, a house that was going to rack and ruin, but then I remembered I myself had suggested there might be some such person around when I saw the gate had been left unbolted. Despite its condition, somebody would have to keep an eye on the place. Besides, Jamie seemed to know what he was talking about. Don't worry, he's half blind and hard of hearing, he added in a whisper. Get down and watch. A half blind man keeping an eye on things. <laughs> that seemed fitting enough. Jamie dropped flat on his stomach behind the banister, and we, ha uh, we hastily flattened ourselves beside him. With my arm hanging, or with my arm over my football alongside me, and my heart banging against the dusty floorboards, I listened to the shuffling footsteps and stared goggle-eyed between two ornately carved balusters at the room below. The footsteps came from the part of the house opposite to the side we had entered, and were accompanied by the querulous grumblings of someone talking to himself. Through a wide arch to the left came a scarecrow of a man in, a ba in baggy, dirt-colored work clothes and a moth-eaten felt hat with the brim drooping in a tired, wavy line. He was carrying a broken axe handle, clutched like a club. He came to a slow, shuffling stop near the foot of the staircase and peered around in every direction with eyes that were fierce and blank. I was terrified when he glared straight up at us, but it was plain from the way his glance kept moving, he couldn't see us. Suddenly, he brandished the axe handle and raised his voice in a badgering whine. Where are you, Jamie Bly? I know you're in here again. You get out of here and take that brute of a dog with you, or I'll fix you good. Of course, none of us made a sound. I don't know whether, every, I don't know whether anyone else was holding his breath, but I certainly was. I rolled my eyes sideways enough to glimpse Jamie's face. His lips were parted unpleasantly, and he was watching the old man with a sort of bored contempt, as though he would have hated him if it had been worth the trouble. The caretaker's voice subsided into a half-intelligible mumble, and he resumed his slow patrol across the room. When he had disappeared through the door at the far end, Bill muttered, What'll we do now? How long is he going to hang around? He'll come back through in a minute. What if he sees Major out there? Oh, don't worry about that. Old Major's too smart for him. Jamie seemed to be right about this, because we heard no further outbursts from the old man, and a moment later he returned and recrossed the room. He was still mumbling uncomplimentary things about Jamie, but this time he did not stop at the stairs. His footsteps faded, a door scraped the floor, then silence filled the house again. Bill was on his feet. Let's get out of here. What's your hurry? He's gone. He may not stay gone. Come on, Bruce. Once again, Bill had my backing. I was right behind him on the stairs. Jamie made scornful noises, but there was no stopping us, so he followed along. The slanted stair treads creaked and rattled so loudly under our feet it seemed impossible anyone could be too deaf to hear us. And my nervous glance saw in every shadowy, uh, in every shadowy corner a lair for unimaginable attackers. Never had Bill seemed heavier footed than he did at that moment, picking his way deliberately across the huge room, defying the house to make him hurry. But at last, we reached the smaller room and the door to the garden. And then, a dire premonition sent my heart plunging. I was sure the caretaker had locked the door. Bill took hold of the knob and turned it. 
My premonition was false. The door was not locked. Probably no longer had a workable lock at all. He pulled the door open and we stared out into the gloom of the weed-choked garden. Major was nowhere in sight. Bill jumped down clumsily and heavily. I sailed out like a grasshopper. Jamie calmly pulled the door closed and dropped easily to the ground. A sudden challenge startled us. Here ye are! The old caretaker careened violently into sight around the corner of the house. He still carried the axe handle and looked crazy enough to beat our brains out with it. Weedy grass swished around our flying feet as we broke into a mad run, racing toward the dark hole in the tangled shrubbery. I heard Jamie cry, Stop that, Major! Come! And I saw the big dog in a corner of the garden as I rushed past. He was digging. He had dug a shallow hole and something stuck up out of it that was like a sliver of old ivory or a small age yellowed bone. Something I caught only a blurred glimpse of before I plunged into the trellised tunnel behind Bill with my head down and my breath coming hard. With my football clutched in my arms, I must have looked like somebody going for a touchdown. We flashed through the darkness of the tight passageway, fought our way through the tangle of bushes beyond it, and reached the splintery door in the wall. Bill put all his beef into a yank that dragged it open. We burst into the quiet street. (laughs) Jamie was close behind us, enjoying our fright. Major wallowed along at his heels as they came through the doorway. Hold it, called Jamie. That old stiff can't run this far, so take it easy. Go soak your head, Bill snarled over his shoulder, and we didn't slow down until we had turned the corner and were out of sight of the house. Only then did we stop, winded, and bent double as we tried to puff some breath back into our lungs. Jamie had stayed with us relentlessly. Now he stopped alongside us and pointed at me. If you want to see a ghost, get a load of him, he wisecracked to Bill. He's pale enough to be one. Shut up, was the best retort I could provide at such a moment, wheezing it out in a feeble gasp. You guys make me laugh, said Jamie. I could have told you you wouldn't see any ghosts in that old dump. Bill's eyes blazed at him in a way that should have made him glad he had Major along. Never mind the ghosts. You you could have told us that crazy old nut of a caretaker was there. Uh, he's nothing to worry about. The only reason I sneak in is to have fun with him. If he gets the police after you, maybe you won't talk so big. I'm not worried about him. He'll be out of a job next week anyway, because I know something he doesn't even know. Next week, they're going to start tearing it down. That house? Yes. You're nuts. It's all tied up in the courts. Not anymore. It's been settled, said Jamie, as cocksure as if he had been a lawyer himself. Oh, how do you know that? I know, so forget it. Jamie's sly eyes measured us thoughtfully, and abruptly he changed the subject. You guys going Halloweening tonight? We glowered at him. In the gathering dusk, some street lights had come on. One of them, behind Jamie and across the street, threw his shadow long and thin across the sidewalk in front of us. What if we are? said Bill. Jamie chuckled. It'll be pretty tame, he predicted, and the glance Bill and I automatically exchanged was an admission that this, at least, was a point we could not argue with. Our usual Halloween adventures were not likely to equal what we had just been through. Even the present moment, alone on the deathly quiet Mount Alban roadway with Jamie and Major, was eerier than the familiar streets of our own neighborhood could ever hope to be. Jamie watched us, and all at once his manner changed. He cocked his head to one side and studied us with intense and unsmiling earnestness. Listen! If you really want to see some ghosts, just say so. I'll show you some. You want to? The matter-of-fact way he asked us 
was like asking if we wanted to see a movie or a litter of new puppies. The ridiculousness of his question made Bill stare at him and then snort. Sure, why not, he jeered. Okay then, you meet me tonight and you'll see some real ghosts. Huh, <laughs> are you kidding? I'm not kidding. Oh, uh, go home and call the doctor. You're nutty. There's no such thing as real ghosts. And if you think so, you're nutty as a jaybird. No, I'm not. Jamie looked at us with all the confidence in the world and said something that nearly dropped us in our tracks. I know there are ghosts, he said, because I live with them. <laughs>